I think we are, uh, we're about ready to start. Sorry for the delay. Um, I'll try to make up for it by being super brief myself. I'm in many ways going to be the most boring person on this panel. I have the least to say. But I did want to kind of welcome you here, um, say a little bit about the seminar series, um, and also introduce this seminar in particular, and uh, um, get going with our speakers. So this is, uh, um, as some of you hopefully will know, this is the sixth Culture and Health webinar. Um, the webinar series is relatively unique in that it tries to uh, take a, a health angle and illuminate it from a kind of perspec perspective of, of culture and, uh, and health. So we try to bring, in, bring on board um, a variety of interdisciplinary speakers from different sectors, from different academic backgrounds, to try and um, illuminate and think about some of the health challenges that we all experience from different perspectives. Um, and the, the, the idea really behind it is to, uh, um, to try and um, really make us think a little bit more about so things that we think uh, um, or that we experience uh, as kind of factual or, or um, incontrovertible and to try and see if we can get perhaps different perspectives and, and different ideas on those topics. So the purpose of this particular seminar is to, uh, to highlight a, a forthcoming Health Evidence Network Synthesis report that we'll be publishing shortly um, on uh, cultural mediators and the use of cultural mediators in the WHO European region, some of the challenges associated with, uh, with uh, um, cultural mediators, why sometimes they work, why, why sometimes they don't work, um, and uh, um, perhaps even get into some of the recommendations um, or at least policy con considerations that that the governments and member states might want to think about if they're interested in rolling out effective cultural mediator um, programs. Um, so a couple more things in terms of housekeeping before we, uh, we get going. We use a, a kind of um, interesting interface called Slido, which allows you to ask questions online, but also in the room. So if you've got a mobile phone and you want to um, participate, feel free to uh, log on to uh, the URL sli.do and enter the hashtag WHOCH, that's WHO Culture and Health. And that'll give you an interface there where you can ask questions, where you can upvote or even downvote questions. And at the end of the seminar, uh, or at the end of the speaking um, part of the, the seminar, we'll have a list of questions online that we can, uh, um, that we can refer back to and, uh, and ask. But of course, for those of you who are in the room, you're also more than welcome to just, in the old fashioned way, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get to you and we'll get to ask, you'll get to ask your questions. Um, so hopefully people online will, uh, will log on to, to Slido and interact with us in that way. So that's, uh, that's pretty much it from, from my side. For the people in the room, I'd also just like to uh, let you know, you will see that there are some um, uh, evaluation forms. They're mainly in the front row, and of course, most of the people have sat in the back rows. So if I can uh, um, encourage you afterwards to maybe come uh, to the front to grab one of the evaluation forms and um, fill that in, it helps us hugely. Um, the evaluation forms are also online on the um, Slido poll. So if you're using that interface, you can also answer the, uh, the questions online. So, without further ado, that's my part finished. I will uh, hand over to, to Hans Verrept. Hans is actually the author of the HEN report that I, uh, that I mentioned to you. Um, he is, uh, since 1999, Hans has been the head of the Intercultural Mediation and Policy Support Unit at the Federal Public Service for Health, uh, Safety of the Food Chain and the Environment in, uh, um, in Belgium. Um, he's in charge of intercultural mediation in the Belgian hospitals. Um, and has helped set up a video remote intercultural mediation program for healthcare services. So Hans is going to give us a kind of uh, um, a summary and introduction to the, to the report that we'll be publishing um, and uh, um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks Hans. Thank you very much Niels. Um, well, yes, uh, welcome everybody. I will give a brief overview of what you will find in the report uh, in a few weeks probably. And I think it's the presentation actually, the slides are on the screen. I'll give you the clicker. Okay. So it's about intercultural mediators in healthcare. And what I would like to discuss basically is first of all, look into what intercultural mediators in Europe, in the WHO European region are doing, what tasks they are performing, how they are defined. Then have a look at how effective they are, what, what we know about that. And finally, uh, give some policy considerations uh, to improve their effectiveness. So the first thing that we will discuss briefly is the definition of what intercultural mediators are because it's a, a subject that is not without its controversy. 
And um, what, what I found when I was reviewing the literature is that intercultural mediators in themselves are a very diverse group trying to serve a very diverse uh, clientele in healthcare. And they are very different in this respect, that some intercultural mediators are mainly working in, in what we call a trialogue, uh, mediating between one healthcare provider and a patient. Some of them are working with groups of patients, providing health education. Some of them are very much involved in, in discussing with healthcare institutions how they could adapt uh, their services, etc., etc. So it's a diverse group in itself. But generally speaking, we can say that intercultural mediators are intermediaries who act as a bridge between cultures to reduce the interference of sociocultural differences on the accessibility and quality of care. Now, this is something we know from the literature that migrants and refugees may have difficulties accessing uh, healthcare services, that's one thing. Second thing, the, the, the quality of care they may be receiving is often not uh, the best they should, the, what, what they should be getting there. Because of a number of barriers, the quality of care may be suboptimal. What do they actually do? And if you look at the literature, you, what you see is that nearly all intercultural mediators are involved in interpreting or managing linguistic differences. That's a very important dimension. This may be interpreting, this may be presenting, uh, doing presentations on the healthcare system to refugees in the, in the language of the refugees. They may even be translating texts in some of them. So that's the first important element. Second, a very important is, uh, theme is that they are involved in culture brokering, what we call culture brokering. They try to provide information on the culture of patients and also the culture of healthcare providers or healthcare institutions that may be relevant for the healthcare delivery process. And that's uh, very central to their work, and we will have some examples of that later on, I think. Second, uh, the, the third one is that they are nearly all involved in conflict prevention, and some of them also in conflict resolution. Apparently, from the literature, it becomes clear that in many cases there is a lot of tension between care providers and migrants and refugees for, uh, for a number of reasons. One of them, that communication is very difficult and that this leads to a lot of tension and stress and that conflicts are, can easily appear. And mediators are often involved in trying to resolve or prevent conflicts. So all these I have uh, grouped together under the, the heading facilitation of the therapeutic relationship. There, is one, there are two other tasks that are very common among intercultural mediators as empowerment, trying to empower the patient through providing knowledge and skills to patients to make effective use of healthcare services. And finally, advocacy. And this is something I think very important. Advocacy uh, happens when uh, mediators stand up for patients who who may be the victim of discrimination or racism in healthcare. An understudied theme, I think, in, in healthcare, uh, because it exists and it's, it's not uncommon and we don't talk a lot about it. These tasks seem to be shared by most intercultural mediators in the European region. And in, on top of that, some of them will be involved in forms of counselling, like the HIV uh, counselling uh, phone service that existed in Italy for some time, some of them will be involved in health education or health literary sessions, uh, like in Slovenia some mediators did. And uh, some of them, in, in particular in mental health care, will be involved, uh, will have a role as some kind of a co-therapist, helping to, pro to provide culturally competent mental health services. So this is for the, the roles they seem to be uh, fulfilling. The second a uh, point I would briefly like to go into is how effective are intercultural mediators? Because we see that in many countries, I think, is between depending upon the sources, between 17 and 19 countries in the European uh, region, we see that intercultural mediators are being employed. And at the same time, we see that very little studies exist on the effectiveness of these intercultural mediators to improve access, the access and the health status of uh, migrants and refugees. There are hardly there are no studies in the last 10 years that provide information on, of, on the impact on health status of the involvement of intercultural mediators. So that's a big, a big problem, I think. We don't have a lot of empirical material. But what is on the positive side, first of all, we see that a number of uh, experts in healthcare for migrants very much stress the need for intercultural mediators and what they, they, they base themselves upon the observations they have done, but not through systematic research, 
on the contribution of intercultural mediators to the quality of care. And so you find quite many articles where experts in health and migration stress the need and the essential contribution of intercultural mediators to health care. And then we find about 15 uh, empirical research uh, documents that provide empirical evidence on the evidence of intercultural mediators, not on the outcome of healthcare so much, but on the process of healthcare delivery. And we are talking about the quality of communication, which is <laughs> obviously very much improved through the involvement of intercultural mediators, and the development, even imp uh, as important, I think, the development of a relationship of trust. And these two come up again and again in the literature and are at the heart of good quality health care. As Martin Söderman, who is working here in, in Denmark in Önse, once said, if you don't have good communication, if you can't create a trustful relationship in health care, it's very unlikely that this health care is going to be very effective. And the last point I would like to, to stress is that we see in the literature also that the healthcare services have been adapted thanks to the interventions of intercultural mediators in a number of cases uh, to the needs of migrants and refugees uh, because these mediators provide information on what needs these patients may have. So as a result of the good communication, as a result of the, the development of a trustful relationship, we see that people tell more and that we are better informed about the needs, for instance, uh, the fact that uh, people have social problems, uh, have been victims of sexual violence, have mental health issues. These problems are much more easily presented when mediators are present and healthcare services can adapt uh, themselves to these needs that show up thanks to the mediators. So the last slide. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, policy considerations, things that should be done, I think, to increase the effectiveness of intercultural mediators. I think we should uh, develop and implement training for intercultural mediators much more than it exists today. And so one of the critiques on intercultural mediation has been that many mediators are very poorly prepared for their tasks and their tasks have been described as an unrealistic array by some or an interdisciplinary minefield. As some people have been very harsh in their comments on, the, on, on intercultural mediators. I think some mediators really are hardly prepared at all. Some have only one day or two days of training and afterwards they, they have to start working. So that's not good. We need standardized training, I think. We need professional standards. We need uh, some point of reference for mediators that, can, uh, that gives them some guidance in their work. And in Belgium, for instance, exists a guide for intercultural mediation for in healthcare. We need also, and this becomes very clear from the literature, quality assurance processes. And a very important aspect of that is supervision sessions for the mediators because they, they, it's a quite a difficult and challenging job and they need to have a possibility to discuss difficult cases they may have encountered. And finally, to make it a full-fledged a full profession, we need certification and accreditation. It's a profession that is not really recognized in most European countries, which means basically that anyone can be uh, taken from a community and people give them one day of training and they say you're a mediator. And, but this is not, of course, the way it should function. You need certification, you need accreditation to turn it into a real profession. Second point I would like to stress that also comes up from the review is that we should train care providers <laughs> to work with mediators. Generally speaking, they are not trained to work with mediators and they don't really know what to expect from a mediator. And combined with the fact that mediators have not been very well trained and sometimes lack professional standards, it becomes a bit um, unclear what can be expected and what is going to happen. So in the literature we find the reference uh, quite often that care providers should be trained to work with mediators and should receive some practical training through role plays with mediators and should have a chance to talk to mediators to see how they work, can work together. And the last point I want to, to make is that we would need formal strategies to maximize the effectiveness of mediators in the healthcare sector. What you see now in Europe is that you have all kinds of small programs, projects about intercultural mediators. They appear and they disappear after some time very often. Intercultural mediators, as a result, they can't make a living out of it because it's a very unstable source of income very often. And what we would need is, on the one hand, this training, this prof professionalization, and on the other hand, it would be good if governments or authorities would uh, take measures to make intercultural mediators available for patients and care providers whenever 
and uh, wherever needed. And this is something we also see very often intercultural mediation programs are very local and you'll have an intercultural mediator at a hospital but not in a primary care center. And as a result, the access to intercultural mediators is very, very difficult. So I think we should get out of the, pro the project stage in a way because it's not very conducive to an effective management of intercultural mediation services. So these are the main points <laughs> that come out of the, of, uh, of the, the report. And I hope you, you'll have uh, the chance to read the complete report in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Whoa, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Hans. That was uh, um, a super interesting overview. I'm, um, I'm going to drive along the uh, um, the presentations now, also in, in the interest of time. Um, so I'm going to um, hand over to um, Santino. Um, Santino is a, uh, um, a true... Uh, renaissance man, I would say, of uh, public health. He's a, a medical doctor, a health economist, an epidemiologist, and an experienced systems manager who has uh, over 24 years of experience as an international senior technical advisor and, ex and executive. And, and since 2013, I believe, um, Santino has led the public health and migration program in the division of policy and governance for health and well-being at WHO Europe. And it's in that capacity, Santino, that we'd, uh, we've invited you and, and just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on the, um, on the presentation that Hans has just given and, and also on the kind of um, the, some of the um, findings of the report um, at large. Over to you. Thank you, Niels. Uh, well, happy to be here and thank you, Hans, for this excellent uh, work. Uh, it, it's a kind of expected, we are curious to see the final product because the uh, paper you are you have been presenting just now uh, was a kind of uh, um, commitment that came out from previous study we conducted here in, uh, in in the office. Building on your presentation, I like to use few minutes uh, available for my intervention to really throw on the floor some provocations because. What is WHO role in all this business? Are we an editorial company committing study? Are we a research? No. Uh, we are sitting in between, try to broker the best evidence and to really package that and uh, try to influence changes, actions at the country level. When we are coming to the issue of uh, health and migration and the element of cultural mediator, med mediator and mediation, I like particularly because Everybody knows, or at least I've been hearing once, talking about cultural mediators. But what that means for the health system, what that means to have them in place, or the policy question you just raised, is a totally different story. And uh, uh, the uh, first element which came very strong to our uh, mind, working on migration health, they need to really make it find strong evidence on which to anchor our suggestion and, uh, and uh, indication to member states. Now, when we go to the issue of uh, uh, cultural mediation, um, we realize that the situation is very fragmented. As you mentioned, a lot of uh, small projects, a lot of initiatives are popping up and disappearing, but we don't see really a systematic change. We don't see really uh, translating evidence into policy and then into operations and services, let's say in a cascade, in an ideal cascade like that. In this region, we try to stimulate that. We engage into developing a policy framework, an action plan, and the element of uh, better quality service, including the availability of cultural mediator, is there. But I do recognize that then there is still a gap, in uh, a gap in know-how or in... Uh, in uh, uh, sustainable planning of the service or what kind of service, an element of competencies of cultural mediator, but also of competencies of healthcare workers, which is still not yet, uh, yet addressed. Uh, in my view, to have a, a change, to have an impact, the real challenge now is related to governance. Let's be very honest. We are talking about cultural mediation. We are, talking, we are in, hosted by... Uh, a colleague which is dealing with cultural element on, on everyday basis, we are in a moment where we are swimming into a context of a, a consistent negative narrative about this topic. And where politicians, politics, as a better harvest of votes, speaking or fueling the negative sentiment, they rather not to engage into structural, structural changes, sorry, which usually 
you need to consider to be implemented in a span life, which is not the span life, uh, how to say, benefiting a political, a political process or a political season. Said that one, the issue is related to governance. The issue is related really to uh, a commitment, a political commitment to uh, strengthen the health system, health service, primary health care, in order to be able to have what we've been preaching since always, to have an health system which is flexible to adapt to the need of the population that serve. And if we look at the population we are serving today, our evidence, our latest report shows that we are talking about the population changing demographically, which is uh, encompassing between 2% to 50% of the population represented by people not born in the country of residence. So the first thing which I would like to add to your beautiful introduction, that when you're talking about cultural mediator, we are not talking about service, which must to be rented in condition of emergency for both people debarking at uh, that harbor, but supposed to be a tool, an element present in a modern health system. What are the uh, entry point, policy and political entry points? Well, uh, never like before, there was a consensus, political consensus around the issue that country they want to have a universal health system approach or to move towards universalistic type of health system, and they committed to that formally in the consensus of the assembly, world assembly, a regional level, and so on. So the element of cultural mediator should be only an element related to healthcare workforce, or maybe supposed to open a very practical door for collaboration, intersectorial collaboration with the educational sector. Uh, we should probably involve the educational sector to rethink about curricula or, or, or type of study that can produce a professional profile for which there is a demand. We all know that the possibility for an healthcare worker or a worker in general, it's between demand and offer. If there is no demand, there is no offer. So in this case, we have a demand, but we are pretty satisfying the demand in a material way rather than, than uh, in a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic manner. Um, I would like to close by, uh, five minutes, right? I would like to close by uh, reinforcing uh, the policy consideration that you found on the, on the hand report. We particularly value those policy considerations because uh, we consider a little bit in a medical uh, type of, uh, allowed me to use this terminology, point of view, and then kind of an anatomy slides across the region. We've been analyzing uh, official gray literature, different language, English, Russian, and so the picture we are getting out is also a picture of uh, information and gaps. But for us, from the research point of view, are extremely important, even gaps, even when you don't have data, because it could be a, a very important source of inspiration for research investment into that. And the uh, policy consideration, what came out from the evidence collected by the end report, shows that we have already, we have in front of us an urgency to really indicate know-how, how to really bridge the evidence that at the moment is available or the policy element or the um, entry point for a better health system, but how countries are supposed to put in place services including uh, <laughs> cultural uh, mediators. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Santino. That's uh, some very thought-provoking uh, um, uh, ideas that we'll, we'll definitely be picking up in the conversation. Just before we go there, we've got one uh, one last speaker. Last but certainly not least, we have a, um, uh, a representative from MSF, um, Adeline Degraté, who is a, a referent for intercultural mediation in Médecins Sans Frontières and Doctors Without Borders. Since 2018, she's providing support to the intercultural mediators deploy, deployed and working in different countries where MSF provides assistance and health care to migrants, regardless of their origin and their status. So um, we, uh, Adeline, I think, is going to give us some very concrete uh, um, uh, information about how uh, um, intercultural mediators and the rollout of intercultural mediators actually works on the ground. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening to, to everybody. Uh, thank you for to WHO for uh, inviting me in this uh, in this panel. And um, I will try to take you to the field to introduce you to our intercultural mediation staff. 
working at the different missions of of MSF. May I have the presentation? Yeah, ah, okay. Ah, all right. So where MSF is working, so as you may know, MSF as medical and humanitarian organization is working in more than 70 countries in the world. In these countries, some projects are dedicated to migrants, to people on the move, uh, countries that are highlighted in orange color. And in the red color, if it looks red, uh, where we have intercultural mediators uh, deployed uh, in our field. We consider that we have three main uh, components of uh, the profession of intercultural mediators in our operations. First one will be uh, on the communicative uh, linguistic level that I will uh, expose to you uh, later. Another one which is more pragmatic, pro pra practical uh, and directive when intercultural mediators autonomously provide a service of information and orientation to the patients. And finally, a psychosocial component. So in the linguistic or communicative components, the most classical uh, role of the intercultural mediators in healthcare, for example, in the medical consultation, where the intercultural mediator, as it's commonly said, uh, is bridging between the patient and the medical doctor, the healthcare provider, it could be also a psychologist, a nurse, even non-medicals like social workers, and conveying messages, translating, interpreting language, and eventually removing some uh, cultural uh, misunderstandings. Another setup could be in this uh, triangular consultations that Hans has uh, talked about, the famous uh, trialogue in our profession, and where uh, the cultural mediator is sitting together with the clinician and the patients, having this dialogue in free, where we, you have to respect a certain uh, balance, equilibrium in this, uh, in this communication, uh, which is uh, relying mostly on the trust that the intercultural mediator is the guarant between the, the clinician and the patient. And this is a specific uh, area where the intercultural mediator is uh, working beside or together with the other professionals. He has a specific setup that we have implemented in a new methodology, an interdisciplinary methodology for victims of torture. And for the specificity of the, the taking in charge of this population, of these victims of torture, we need to have a holistic approach, meaning that every professional, including the uh, intercultural mediators, will take part of interdisciplinary discussions around the case and decisions. In the second uh, area of the profession of intercultural mediators, so when they provide themselves autonomously a service, mostly of orientation and information. For example, we mentioned about the disembarkment of uh, refugees uh, after a shipwreck, for example. The survivors are taken in charge directly at the port by our intercultural mediators, being part of a PFA team, psychological first aid for the survivors. So when psychological first aid is not possible, it is not feasible, for example, on board of a vessel of uh, search and rescue, then we have a specific, um, let's say, job description of intercultural mediators, where they are very involved from the start, from the approaching of uh, the, the boats in distress to the disembarkment of, uh, of the passengers. In between, responding to their primary needs, uh, providing some information, which is very important to maintain a certain level of well-being on board, and also identifying the most vulnerables for purpose of reference afterwards. And then uh, another example where, for example, the intercultural mediator can be involved in the advocacy of, uh, of the patient when accompanying the patient in the healthcare structures, for example, for secondary healthcare reference. But in this case, it is in Torino, and the intercultural mediator accompanies also the beneficiaries to get registered in the national healthcare system and have access to, thank you very much, and have access to, to the Italian healthcare system, and then to access to the rights they are entitled to. 
And finally, the psychosocial components we mentioned earlier, Hans mentioned, so the, the involvement of intercultural mediators to improve the, se the service for the patients, but also in some circumstances, I take you here to uh, Moria Camp in Lesbos in Greece, and we have a specific program of pediatric uh, mental health. And here, our culture mediator, together with the psychologist, has been specifically trained to provide counseling and group or individual psychosocial activities for the little patients. Intercultural mediators, in some cases, also they have to support uh, their colleagues uh, from the other, the, the other services, and in the case of health promotion, for example. So this is an old picture actually from Malta 2008, but most recently could be vaccination campaigns in the camps of Moria in Greece or in, uh, in Serbia. Uh, and here the cultural mediators so convey the message of the health promoters, but also they can adapt the culturally to the audience the health promotion messages. And finally, uh, another way to involve the intercultural mediation uh, for the care of the, the patients in advocacy, so over the individual advocacy, but also we have, uh, we have had the support of our intercultural mediators to collect some testimonies of our patients. For example, in the report of Hans, we mentioned a report that has been done on the violences in the Balkans, at the borders in the Balkans against the migrants. This is one example. Another one here on the screen is a specific uh, kind of advocacy called Expert by Experience, where in our project for survivors of tortures um, in Athens, uh, a group of patients has been organized, facilitated by an advocacy officer and intercultural mediators, allowing the patients to advocate for themselves and for their rights by themselves. I think I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. I just, uh, yeah, just to thank you, and uh, I would be happy to to share some reflections and, and questions with the public. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adeline. Thanks to uh, um, all three of our speakers. So this is uh, where we kind of want your input, your thoughts, your questions. Uh, we're more than happy to to answer them both in the room, and uh, we have some um, on the on the screen as well from from Slido. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to to ask away. I saw a tentative hand in the front. Oh, and then in the back. So we're yeah. already kick kicking off. That's great. So um, please, uh, you know, maybe you can uh, uh, start us off. Yeah, thank you. Pino um, said I'm working in the um, migration and health program here. Uh, I think that you you mentioned already um, the, some of the key aspects of uh, um, of, of this issue. Um, just I would like to, that uh, you elaborate a little bit more on um, the nationality of the intercultural mediator. In the majority, many cases, they are uh, migrants themselves. In some cases, there are some residents. And I don't know if, if you can share with us some uh, reflection on this aspect. And then the second is uh, uh, there are uh, thousands of nationalities in those migrants. It means hundreds of different languages and hundreds of different culture. And sometimes it's of course difficult to find in that hospital, in that health services, someone which is specifically speaking that language or that dialect with that specific culture, etc. There are some attempt of uh, addressing this issue with some sort of virtual services. And uh, uh, so people that are uh, expert in, I don't know, that know, um, I don't know many languages or different people that are available somewhere that can answer to that. I don't know what, I would like to know from, from you what are the, your experience on that. Thank you very much for, for that question. And maybe I can, I can refine that question also or complicate that question even further by saying um, often we, we think of nationalities almost as monoliths. So, so people come from a country or um, a part of a country and as a consequence <coughs> they all have the same backgrounds or experiences. But of course, um, just because somebody might have some experience of a country, it might even be from that country, they might not necessarily represent uh, the beliefs or practices of the person in the room. So there, I guess, is, a, is an added complication about that. But, but yes, I know, um, Hans, maybe you can kick us off. Well, I think... Um First of all, the first question is about ba basically, I think, the, the national or ethnic matching in, in some way of the mediators with the, with the patients they are helping. 
and whether this is a good or a bad thing. And, and I think the, the, what we see is that in most programs, intercultural mediators belong to the same group as the patients they're working for very often. And that sometimes this is an advantage and sometimes it is not. In, in case of uh, people coming from countries where there's been uh, where there's been a lot of spies, for instance, like uh, in, in co uh, countries where there has been recent violence or a, a, a civil war or whatever. So I think that the, <coughs> the answer is not so clear cut. Sometimes it's a big advantage, some, sometimes it's a disadvantage. And then the other thing that you bring up is also the, the issue being of the same group doesn't make you necessarily someone who, is, who knows how to deal with cultu the cultural differences that may be present uh, in these encounters. And there's also, if, if mediators are not, not well trained, there's also always the risk that they will be generalizing their own biographical experience or the, what, what they have known in their environment. So this stresses again the importance of good training. So, eh? And I think ideally we should have access to mediators who are all of them well trained, of course, some of them belonging to the group, uh, they, they, they are serving, and some of, sometimes it may be very positive to have people who are external but very familiar with the group to, to bridge this culture barrier. And then the other question that you were asking is about, well, we have a very high number of uh, different backgrounds in, in Europe these days. We have what we call super diversity, and you, it's completely unrealistic to have intercultural mediators for all these groups present in all healthcare institutions. So what we uh, what we said what exists in Belgium now, and I think it's the first place where we have this is we have video remote intercultural mediation, which is uh, so one mediator working in in, in in a city of Brussels can be uh, called upon for the whole country in primary care centers in hospitals etc, which offers some possibility to have some mediation, but on the other hand it limits the work of the mediator more to the linguistic side of things. You can't a company, a patient, uh, you are limited in the tasks you can perform when it is done remotely through a video conference system. But it's certainly partly the answer to the issue that you raised. And we will in the future, I think there is, it would be good if we would have pro projects where mediators from different countries can work in different countries. For instance, people from England working in, in, in Denmark, if we can't find a suitable mediator here for certain patients. So this is, I think it's, it's going to, to offer, create some possibilities, yeah. Adeline, maybe I can ask you also to speak from your MSF uh, background and experience about how practically on the ground you match, as it were, mediators with uh, um, uh, um, people's requi people requiring mediation. Yeah, so um, actually, so we're trying to have a combination, I mean, a, a relationship, a cultural uh, common relationship between the patient or the cultural mediators, but it's not necessarily, as Hans said, in some certain cases it can be critical, for example, for victims of sexual violence, of tortures, it could be very critical for the patients to be confronted by with somebody from the community. So one thing that we are very, very um, uh, insisting on near our cultural mediators is that we have to make sure of the informed consent of the patient and the patient has an absolutely right to revoke the cultural mediator who is proposed. And in some cases, the patient can say, I prefer to speak in another language, English or Italian, according to, to the context, or to, to have somebody else, but uh, it's an absolutely right of the patient to have somebody he can, can trust. Of course, the cultural mediator is bound by the, the professional secrecy, but because of the feeling of share, the patient can, can refuse to have the, the cultural mediator. On the other side, in terms of uh, recruitment, for example, for the identification, the sourcing of intercultural mediators from different backgrounds, of course, uh, we may not have a cultural mediator for every single language, unfortunately, uh, because of, uh, of resources. Uh, but the migration path, um, it's, it's not a criteria, but of course it gives an, an understanding from the cultural mediator of what the patient has been gone through. And I'm citing this example because uh, we have uh, two years ago run a study in Italy uh, by some colleagues from the Operational Research Unit of MSF. Uh, the title is, uh, I could understand because I made the same trip. And uh, it's a quote from our, one of our intercultural mediators. So it's, it's an important factor that there's a deep understanding of the culture of origin, but what is also of the experience of being a migrant. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go over to the question in the back there, the gentleman uh, with the with the glasses and the blonde. If you could just wait for one second, we'll just pass the microphone to you so that our online audience can uh, um, also hear your question. Thank you. Uh, so you spoke briefly about sort of the um, discrimination that some, some migrants would face. I, I wanted to ask all of you a question about more systematic discrimination. Uh, here in Denmark, the conversation of intercultural mediators is largely grouped with interpreters, which has become larger a question about integration and immigration policy in Denmark, which last year resulted in a new law that says after three years of living in Denmark, um, patients will have to pay uh, at least partly for interpretation services in a healthcare system that's otherwise free. This, is, of course, is an asymmetrical application because most Healthcare professionals in Denmark speak English, so if you're from a so-called Western country and speak English, this doesn't affect you as maybe as necessarily as it would um, if you if you were a, a refugee, for example. So, when communicating with our government partners in the policy year, how do we separate this issue from an immigration integration question to one that has to do with public and human health? Because there's sort of this this gap that's taking place um, to where one policy is going one way, but we have people that are partic particularly come from protracted situations and have chronic illnesses um, and are going to be here and need health care. Um, how, how, how do we make that gap happen? How do we explain that to people? Mm. And particularly, perhaps, how does one explain it to policymakers who have a kind of uh, um, a, a vested interest um, that might be more on a kind of popular or populistic level than a necessarily a kind of um, a change level. I don't know, um, Santino, if I can perhaps uh, um, ask you to, yeah. to reflect on that from a, from a policy level. Well, uh, you went uh, strict, strictly to the uh, matter of the, of, the, of the problem of the issue. Uh, we are talking about, in many cases, people which are, we tend to categorize administratively, uh, we tend to have a legal framework to categorize them and to define the level of, uh, of entitlements we are recognized uh, to them. This because, again, for a, a political and administrative circle, uh, there is also the element of reporting on, on public spending, how the public resources are utilized. Uh, we need to understand that this cycle, this process is heavily influenced by uh, external factor, not, not necessary uh, by evidence and by the real needs. So the result, to make long story short, is that we, have, if we look to our region, we have basically three big category of realities, countries which they say only if you have an emergency, if you are about to die, you can come and you can get treated by my health system. Uh, countries which they say, I recognize that you might be in need a minimum package of services, so I'm giving you emergency plus, and I'm carefully selecting those uh, those services. And countries which, for a political decision, but we need to understand that the political decision is also the one deciding about the health system for the resident population. So again, we are going to the political commitment is for a universal type of access. And those are few of them. Majority are towards emergency or mid kind of, uh, mid kind of level. Now, how we try to influence this, this situation? Well, the element of evidence is absolutely important to see what works and what not, what is cost effective and what not. And for example, we start to collect evidence that proved that paradoxically uh, eliminating uh, people, I'm not talking about migrant refugees, but excluding part of the population from access to basic preventive or curative service means to create a group of population susceptible to diseases, which tomorrow it's even more costly to, to keep, uh, to manage, to keep under control. Uh, we've been analyzing the evidence across the region. Uh, you can find in the report we published in, in, in January, uh, where the, uh, probably the main concern is not so much related to uh, what we call communicable diseases or uh, infective diseases or vaccine preventable diseases, which are still there. The uh, surveillance, the attention to the issue is supposed to never release, but they are not the most important public health issue. 
unless other factors that are coming into picture, which are now I'm not going to uh, name them, but uh, other factors which can make the communicable disease situation or experience uh, an issue of public concern. The uh, evidence shows that people which are, they are moving from a reality, a life course, a lifestyle, a condition of living uh, from their country of origin, plus they are having this question mark period of the migration process, what they get exposed to, how long is this process, how many information do we have about that, but then coming at the country of residence, they tend to acquaint with the reality, not necessarily the reality, and not necessarily the most healthy, the most healthy reality. Let me give you an example. If I'm taking a person moving from a country of uh, uh, developing economy or economy in transition, uh, it probably it's a country where people are more obliged by the reality to move more, less access to junk food, less access to um, risky lifestyle. Uh, Coming here, first of all, they are resettling among the lower class of our society, which are already a concern from the public health point of view to reach them in terms of promoting a lifestyle, a proper lifestyle. But also the condition of poverty, the condition of exclusion can first increase the risk of exposure to possible chronic diseases. If you combine then the legal framework which is deciding what kind of service you can uh, access, what kind of not, well, then the combination can be really, really deadly. For this, we are really investing into massaging the public sector with the evidence. Say, look, it's not like that. It's not a, a catastrophic spending. Uh, look, uh, to have a, a universalistic approach, actually pay back on the long run, which we need to consider. We need to go out from the mentality of emergency type of uh, need. Uh, we have a strong evidence particularly tailored, uh, specialized for high-income, middle-income countries in this region regarding the financial protection. Means what are the menu of action that health sector, policymaker, Ministry of Health can take in order to secure or to prevent catastrophic payment in case of a patient gets sick and all family get broken or, or, or into a catastrophic payment experience to, uh, to pay for service provision. Now, the issue, uh, so to, to conclude, we know what should be done, we know where are the, 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 the issue, but in reality the main challenge is the political dialogue, which now probably uh, is on the, on the peak of the negative experience and negative context. Imagine that only the debate on a, simple, um, on a simple adoption of the Global Compact on Migration, two years later, after the entire world community was uh, enthusiastically committed on the New York Declaration and 100% of the member states supporting this initiative, two years later, when the compact was finalized, there was a tremendous, tremendous fight on the health chapter, chapter 15 of the Global Compact, exactly because Country that felt threatened, that we were ob ob obliging them, pushing them to get additional financial commitment on people which they are having reservation if they have entitlement or not. So uh, the discussion is quite, is quite important and uh, implies also a major um, communication to public because in reality is not only the challenge with the political narrative and, and atmosphere but also the level of lack of information with the uh, normal people with your family with my family with my friends your friends which today are disinformed and easy victim of this information thank you thank you Santino um, I, I want to take a few more questions uh, also um, from the room but also from online I, I've kind of been scrolling through and and I think one of the things that's coming through is, is people would like to have a bit more insight into the kind of on the ground realities of what does it actually mean to uh, to be a cultural mediators and what what um, value um, do they add? Um, and so maybe I can turn to to um, you and Ad Adeline and, and, and Hans to to ask both of you if you can give me an example of a, of, a, of a concrete time when uh, when in your experience a kind of cultural mediator has uh, has come into play and has added value to the clinical context or the clinical experience beyond just being a translator. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, Adina, I don't know if you can perhaps... Uh, yeah, um, um, we have uh, several examples that uh, have been reported from our colleagues uh, in the field. Um, Amesha, an, a typical example, um, uh, I, I presented you this uh, interdisciplinary methodology when we want to, to provide uh, care and rehabilitation for victims of torture. And um, <coughs> actually, it's a case that has been reported by one of our doctors. So this team is, is sitting, discussing and deciding as interdisciplinary team, taking together decisions. They had a patient who had uh, obviously, so who presented himself to this uh, clinic uh, for victims of torture, saying that he has uh, been uh, abused and, uh, and victims of violence when he was uh, in Libya. And, uh, and but during this, um, this first uh, encounter with the team that they do collectively, also, he referred to some attacks that he had some, from some presence, uh, spiritual presence, we may say, uh, that he had during the day, but mostly at night he couldn't sleep because of the attacks of these spiritual presences. From the psycho, uh, even psychiatric uh, point of view, the psychiatric doctor uh, was uh, aiming to, to provide us uh, psychotic uh, medicines, so uh, psycho tropic medicines for, for these patients. But before taking this decision, he had to confront with the interdisciplinary team. And he had the opposition of the social worker, the psychologist, and the intercultural mediator. And um, our intercultural mediator uh, was not from the same country, but um, it, it was a patient from Western Africa. And uh, he could relate that in his country, he had met some people also who had these similar attacks, uh, spiritual attacks and that they are confronted in his home country with different kinds of, of medicines. And, um, and so it was exposed, and the, so the team uh, together has decided to, before to prescribe this uh, psychotrop, uh, psychotropic medicines to the patients, together with the psychologist, who is prepared also in ethnopsychiatry, uh, they will contact uh, some relatives in the home country, and eventually to get in touch with some um, some practitioners of uh, alternative uh, medicines. And uh, so these contacts have been made between the, the, the patients and his relatives in his country, together with the psychologists and with the support of the intercultural mediators. And little by little, the state of the patient in terms of uh, uh, psychological uh, well-being has improved. So uh, actually it has really reversed uh, the diagnostic that has been made uh, initially by the psychiatric doctor on this patient. Uh, obviously the psychiatric doctor didn't really, <laughs> didn't really like, uh, like it, but in the end he, he, rendered, uh, he rendered himself to the, to the decision, the collective decision of the team. And it was thanks to the input of this intercultural mediator that had a similar example uh, that it, we have reversed uh, a bit the, the way of taking charge this uh, this patient. This is an example. Thank you very much. What about you, Hans? Well, I have a, a case that we saw. It's not in the in the report in the Henry report. It's a case that we had in in uh, Belgium, in this in, near the city of Antwerp, where we found that in a mother and child uh, healthcare service, that all Moroccan women in in, in one of these uh, services refused. Uh, immunization for meningitis suddenly so this was a uh, and thanks to the intercultural mediator who would be talking to the women in the waiting room we found out that th- there was a common belief in this group that the the vaccine would be injected through the skull directly into the brain which is of course a very scary operation and it shows us in a way how the, these women did not have access to uh, those magazines people will be reading and uh, on health and, and everything and they, in be- between them, they were coming from the same village in Morocco. They, it was really a close community. Uh, they, they had never spoken about this to the medical doctor. And thanks to the intervention of the mediator, they could talk about what this immunization implied and that it was not the horror, horror story that they thought it would be. So we had, and they easily accepted it afterwards. Thank you very much. That's. Uh, I think that really resonates also with uh, with us um, in the kind of cultural context of health and well-being team, where we talk quite a bit about this idea of um, this public health idea of irrational behaviors, mm-hmm. irrational health behaviors. Um, obviously, for the clinician listening to this uh, this this story about not wanting to have a meningitis um, vaccination, it doesn't make sense. Um, mm-hmm. um, 
but uh, um, uncovering the kind of reasons for certain behaviors actually gives you a sense that most of the time they are highly rational. They are just perhaps based on uh, on misinformation or they're based on certain kind of attitudes mm -hmm. of beliefs. But the decision not to have an intervention or the decision not to do something is often highly rational. We just have to get at the rationale. Mm -hmm. um, I've been uh, um, I've been looking at the uh, the questions and there's there's really quite a lot of of interesting stuff coming through. Um, I realize that we're a little bit over time. Um, hopefully, you've got another five minutes or so. Um, I'd like to perhaps ask each of you one one question in, in turn. Um, and if you could keep your answers relatively short, that would be great. Um, but uh, but yeah, it'd be great to get uh, um, get through some of these. So um, one of the one of the questions that that I think pops up quite a lot in these types of uh, forums is where uh, is where do clinicians with a refugee and migrant background fit in the picture? So this isn't this isn't questions about cultural mediators per se, but this is people who actually have uh, medical backgrounds themselves. How can they be um, how can they be utilized and uh, um, do they act as mediators as well? Um, I don't know if uh, um, anybody in particular wants. I see you nodding your head, um, <laughs> Adeline. Maybe you want to answer that question. Um, yeah, so for um, migrants and refugees who have a medical background, uh, we have met some uh, in the camps. So uh, we have some also, uh, I met some intercultural mediators of our teams uh, who were actually nurses or medical doctors in their home country. But unfortunately, I mean, due to their situation, they are not uh, necessarily here for in, in the country of um, um, of uh, arrival for a long time and they don't have the necessary uh, transformation of their diplomas recognized in the system where they are staying. So we may not employ a medical doctor coming from Afghanistan, for example, because it doesn't have the necessary authorization to, uh, to act uh, as a medical doctor in Greece. We have some cases where we have uh, yeah, medical staff or paramedical staff who have been employed as intercultural mediator. They have a great uh, added value in our teams, obviously. Santino, you said you yeah, wanted to... Just to, to complement uh, the answer, uh, the main challenge is the recognition locally of mm. the uh, professional title, because there are, of course, uh, quite important legal, medical uh, implications uh, related to that. But there are very interesting experiences. I would like to name two countries as, a, as example, Germany and Turkey. Uh, Germany uh, re-training, um, reprofiling some of the healthcare workers, doctor and nurse, in order to uh, offer them a kind of uh, um, certified uh, new license to practice in the in their environment. In Turkey, there was a big process of uh, really uh, employ healthcare workers from Syria into ad hoc primary healthcare facility established to expand the capacity, the catching uh, capacity of the health system to offer service to uh, 4 million re refugees living in, uh, in, in Turkey. So there are very interesting mm. uh, pilot experience over there. Mm. And there are a number of initiatives actually looking into this issue. Mm, very interesting. Okay, so um, two more questions perhaps. Uh, um, and I, might, I think I'll, I'll ask you this uh, this one, Hans, because it kind of speaks directly to uh, to the report. Um, what is your experience of the differences in countries across Europe regarding the use and training of intercultural mediators, and what may be driving this? I think the second part of that question is particularly interesting because, um, you know, perhaps there are some um, unexplored rationales again why different countries are employing um, cultural mediators in different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's very little information to be found on that in the literature. What you see is that a number of countries are relatively well developed in this field, like Italy, uh, France, Belgium, um, Spain as well. And uh, that other countries, have, we see that intercultural mediation is becoming uh, a profession or is, be is now uh, popping up as a result, an immediate result of the, the refugee crisis that we experienced recently. Why it is that in certain countries it, it developed so, so well, although it's always on a relatively small scale, is, is, does not become clear from the literature, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. so, but it, it, and, and what is striking is that in countries where you find intercultural mediators, the ever-lasting uh, uh, discussion on whether we would need interpreters or intercultural mediators is still going on, mm -hmm. even after 25 or more years. So, but it's, it's an answer, a question that we can't really answer. Mm -hmm. So that maybe leads us to the final question, which rests on your shoulders, Santino. It's a big question. 
Um, I feel it. Um, again, we're, we, we, you know, we've kind of been exploring around the peripheries of this, uh, um, of this question throughout the seminar, but if you were to kind of pinpoint um, um, a single, the, the kind of greatest barrier um, for uh, a more systematic um, uh, uptake of cultural mediators, a systematic implementation of um, cultural mediators, do you have a sense what that, what that single um, greatest barrier might be? I was. I think I would go again to the uh, understanding that is a worth investment for the health sector to uh, diversify capacity, to refine capacity, especially at the entry point level. What I tried to uh, explain before, uh, in a context where average in this region we are having that one of ten patients tomorrow morning going to GP is not Danish. Probably this is uh, showing that this is a need. And actually, a little bit in a provocative way, I like to bring up the issue where the demographic diversity, we are not talking about migrants and linguistic and cultural barrier, but we are talking about citizens in a country where there is a lot of attention to malpractice and legal implication of malpractice. The behavioral science exam is a part of the toolkit of the GP and clinicians and gynecologists and nurses for the health system in the US, which uh, has to deal with a very diversified population. So probably today we are facing the uh, 1.0 uh, situation, generation, where we try to position ourselves, and I'm saying ourselves, our health system to be cost effective and to be uh, capable to manage the situation. By reality, if I'm looking at this in a trend, in a demographic type of trend, uh, health systems better to start to understand that population will be different from now and 20 years. So probably the element of different culture uh, we, uh, we need to get use of this region, this point, point of view in the uh, in the bed in the toolkit of the clinicians, nurses, and healthcare workers in the primary care hospital care itself. Thank you very much, and I'm actually quite happy you didn't say that the single biggest barrier is evident because I think to some extent we exaggerated the kind of evidence gaps gaps or things sometimes sometimes evidence is good enough and it's good enough to act on to 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 to